Just to think, we too once were like that. Don't be quick to judge. When I was younger, well, when I was a little bit younger, and I first got my car, I was 16 years old. Now you can get more information about my own uh, self-perception from my wife here. But when I was 16 years old, for some reason, I used to think very highly of myself. And so I had long hair and a convertible car. And, and I would drive through the streets with music just blasting, thinking I was the coolest thing since Wonder Bread. You know, and white sunglasses. And I used to think I was cool. And now I see these teenagers doing the same thing. I'm like, what's wrong with these people? <laughs> Who do they think they are? Turn down that music. <laughs> and then I, re I remember, only by God's grace, right? Only by God's grace. So let's pray this morning as we get started. Lord, our God and Father, we thank you because only by your grace, the grace that only comes from you, do we stand here today. Everything we have, everything we are is by your grace. And I pray that you would open our eyes this morning to see the many ways that you are working for our good. And we pray that you would open our hearts to receive your word, that you will open our ears to hear and understand, and that we would not be like the foolish person who hears and sees but goes back to their normal way of life, but that we would be changed that we would also go into the world and bear forth the light that you've put in us to show all others, all nations, all people that there is one God, one Lord, one Savior and that all people can come to him and be restored. And we thank you because you are the good shepherd. Lead us this morning and feed us so that we might trust in you and that we might continue to grow and become more and more like your son. And it's in his name, the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <clears throat> so today we will continue on our series of the broken signposts. If you were not here for the first three uh, parts of the series, I would encourage you to go on our church website or our church Facebook page or our church's YouTube page. And we have there the playlist for this series, Broken Signposts. Today, today's Broken Signposts, as you can see, there is justice and freedom. Before we get started on that, I just want to kind of catch us up where we've gone through. As, as you remember, when we were going through the book of Philippians, towards the end of the book, Paul summarizes his teaching in saying this to the Philippians. I want you to devote yourself, to fill yourselves up with whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely or beautiful, and whatever is good or having to do with love and kindness. And so those six things are things that as we were finishing the book, I was thinking and I realized when Paul talks about that, he is assuming that we understand, and that was part of the, that message that day as we walked through Philippians chapter 4, was that we fill ourselves up with these things just like a tree fills itself up with the waters from the riverside. Like the tree in Psalm 1. It's planted by the riverside, feeds from the water, and then bears fruit. But the danger is, <clears throat> the danger we find, is that these things, truth, honor, justice, glory, purity, beauty, goodness, kindness, those things are things that most people acknowledge to be worthy. Most people acknowledge that to tell the truth is better than to tell a lie. Now, they might lie themselves, but as soon as someone lies to them, they say, hold on a second, you shouldn't do that. They might not respect others, but they want to be respected. You see, internally, we all understand these things to be good. And the danger lies in that we might pursue these things in and of themselves. We might pursue truth without pursuing the God of truth. We might pursue justice or honor without pursuing the God of honor. And in fact, that's what our world typically ends up doing. 
And the reason we call them broken signposts is because there are ways that at first they seem right. They seem like they're leading us in the right direction. If I would just devote myself to telling the truth, if I would just devote myself to doing things that are good and right, or if I would just devote myself to pursuing honor and glory, then I would live a life worthy of being lived. But as Proverbs teaches us, there's a way that seems right to men. But in the end, it leads to destruction. You see, truth pursued by itself, as we saw when we walked through Psalm 19, is just as good as an x-ray. It can tell you what is wrong, but it can't fix the problem. But the God of truth can fix the problem. As we saw last time when we walked through Psalm 8 in glory and honor, we, as made in the image of God, are called to glory and honor. But if we pursue that apart from the God of glory and honor, we will settle for less things. Things that one day will corrode. Things that one day will rust. Things that will cause us to waste our life and actually give up true glory and true honor, which as we saw was eternal life in the presence of God. And today we stand justice and freedom. As we see up there, justice and freedom pursued by itself may seem right, but will eventually let you down and disappoint you. But on the other hand, what we find out in Psalm 23, the God of justice, the God of freedom, the good shepherd himself will never leave us. He'll never forsake us and he'll never disappoint us. Now, as I said before, the reason why these things are dangerous is because they seem right at first by themselves. I mean, think about it. Justice and freedom, the pursuit to put things to right, see something broken, desiring to fix it, see something going wrong, see people oppressed, the desire to freedom, is something that comes, for the most part, naturally to most people. If I tell you 2 plus 2 is 3, what do you feel inclined to do? If I say 2 plus 2 is 3, what do you feel like doing? You feel like the need to correct me. If I say, I'm pointing down, you feel the need to correct me. You see, justice, the pursuit of correcting, of putting things right, is all around us. Whether it's a little boy or a little girl saying, hey, that's not fair, I should get a lollipop too. Or whether it's the HOA telling you, your weed is too tall. You shouldn't have above ground pools in your yard. Take it down. Personal experience this past week. You have 10 days to remove your pool, or we'll fine you $100 a day. <sighs> because it's above ground. But if it's in ground, apparently it's okay. I will dig a big hole and put it, put it in there. <laughs> the pursuit of justice is all around us. Everyone wants it. Little kids want it. Big kids want it. We could summarize the history of the world as the pursuit of freedom, the pursuit of justice, always wanting to put things to the right. Now we should ask, why is that? Why is that so common? Why is it that inside we feel this desire to put things right? As we saw in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above has handiwork. And we saw the reason that we pursue truth is because there is a God of truth. And because God is, two plus two will always be four. No matter if you're in China, Pakistan, Iran, United States, two plus two will always be four. And so we always feel the desire to, if we see two plus two and somebody says it's three, we feel the desire to correct it. Because we know there's such a thing as truth. There is such a thing as right. And when we see something wrong, we feel the desire to fix it. Because there is a God. And He is the one who sustains all of reality. 
Now, the second reason why we feel this desire is think about this. If you went to a monkey, who apparently is our ancestor, so congratulations, you are just a well-developed monkey. <laughs> If you go to a monkey and you say two plus two is three, what would that monkey do? He might just keep eating his banana or he might throw poop at you. <laughs> but he doesn't care or she doesn't care. Why is that? I thought truth was everywhere. I thought justice was everywhere. Why is it that we care? What's different about us and the monkeys or us and that banana? We were created in the very image of the God who created all things. The God who created all things as good created you and me in His image. So that when we see something wrong, we feel the desire to fix it, or to at least get someone to fix it for us, or to just sit back and complain about how it's not being fixed. But we feel that desire, because God made us in His image. Now, you might be thinking, all right, everyone desires justice, every, because we're made in God's image. He is a God of justice. He's a God who made all things right. But as we look around, and this is why this is a broken signpost, it doesn't take long before we realize that this pursuit of justice, the little boy saying, it's not fair that I didn't get a lollipop. The HOA, take down your pool. It's not, it doesn't take too long before that little boy who once was pursuing justice so that everyone would have the fair number of lollipops grows up and in his pursuit of justice becomes so consumed with his power and his authority that soon he takes everyone's lollipops away so that he can have all of them to himself and so his friends can have some too. It doesn't take long before the pursuit of justice becomes corrupted. That same man or that same woman who once as a little child wanted for everybody to just share and get along now is taking from others to use for himself or herself. It doesn't take long for justice to become corrupted. Over time, what ends up happening is my pursuit of justice becomes my pursuit of what I think is right. Of justice according to my own ways, my own understanding. Why is that? The Bible also teaches us that what happens after God makes man in his image? They rebel. And what happens to that image? It becomes corrupted. It becomes broken. So that the very same evil that I fight against over there turns out to be the very same evil that is within me. The very same evil that causes the brokenness in the world is the evil found in me. And the Bible calls that sin. This brokenness within us that causes this pursuit to become corrupted. And so it doesn't matter. You look around and you see people with good intentions eventually using that power corruptedly for their own sake because sin will always taint until Jesus returns, sin will taint our pursuits of justice. We will start defining justice as what I think is right. What benefits me. Some of you may have suffered from people like that who use their power and their money and their authority to twist what justice is for their gain and for your loss. Now, you may also be thinking, hold on a second, I know at least a handful of people who through the history of the world have pursued justice in a way that's good. I mean, think of it. Think of King Solomon. King Solomon was a good king. There was peace. There was freedom in his kingdom. Think even in our own history, as we saw last, last week, celebrating 4th of July, the forefathers did do something good in pursuing religious freedom, in pursuing to establish a nation that was built under God. They did do something good. Not all pursuits of justice are corrupt, are they? Now think with me. King Solomon, the forefathers, let's say Abraham Lincoln, for example, a good example of someone who pursues justice. 
Think also Teddy Roosevelt. People say he was a good president. He pursued justice and in many cases achieved it. What do all these people have in common? What does King Solomon have in common with Roosevelt and the forefathers? They pursued justice. They were victorious in many of the cases. But when it came time to facing that one enemy, they all lost. When it came time to face the enemy of enemies, they all lost. What is that enemy? Death. King David, King Solomon, all the kings after, Abraham, Lincoln, the forefathers, George Washington, Roosevelt, any good leader that has ever lived who actually did something good, even if sin didn't corrupt them while they were here, the grave stopped their efforts short. And soon arose a new generation who twisted everything they worked for. We're experiencing that right now, aren't we? As the, the work that the previous generations have labored and sweat and bled and worked for, they lost to the great enemy, death. And now, a new generation rises and twists everything back to brokenness. So when it's not sin corrupting the efforts, death will win. And so what do we do? The pursuit of justice and freedom. Do we give up? Do we become depressed? Do we go hide in our houses? Some do that. Do we say, well, if everyone's going to lie and steal and cheat and destroy, then I'm going to do the best and take it for myself and protect me and my family. Even though this is the case, we still feel that tension. And so we surround ourselves with prominent leaders and we flock behind them. We flock after them, pursuing the justice and the freedom that they promised. Isn't that what it seems like when you go to the po political rallies? People flocking after a prominent leader who is promising prosperity, peace, justice, freedom. That is typically what ends up happening, is we attach ourselves to a prominent figure who promises these things. But later, they disappoint us. You see, in the ancient times, they had a title for these kinds of people. These people who would promise peace, prosperity, justice, freedom. Do you know what they called them? Kings. Rulers. And you know what else they called them? Shepherds. In fact, in the ancient times, in the times of the scriptures of the Old Testament, it was common in that region to refer to the kings and to the rulers as the shepherds of the people. The Bible is not grabbing this out of midair. David, when he's writing Psalm 23, he's not just saying God is like a shepherd with regular little sheep. That is some of the picture. But he is using this shepherd metaphor that is used to refer to the kings, to the rulers of the nations, the ones who promise peace, who promise prosperity, who promise freedom and justice. And in the end, every single one disappoints us, whether through corruption by sin or whether through being corrupted by death. And so David in this situation, one of the kings himself, one who was called the shepherd of Israel, he writes a song. And listen to his declaration, Psalm 23. The Lord, that's Jehovah, the covenant God who appeared to Moses, Yahweh, sometimes pronounced Jehovah, the Lord, who made a promise to Abraham, who made a promise to Moses, who made a promise to Isaac and Jacob. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In other words, the Lord is the one I flock after in the pursuit of freedom and justice. Here is a king acknowledging, I cannot bring you true justice and freedom. I, myself, the king, pursue the true shepherd. And so my question for you this morning is, who will you flock after 
in your pursuit of justice and freedom because you will pursue it. Will you pursue it by the prominent figures of this world who will disappoint you? Or will you pursue it by your own strength and seeking vengeance by your own hands? And I want to remind you, you will disappoint yourself. Or will we learn from the words of Scripture, simple truth, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In other words, I have what I need. I will lack nothing. He will provide. Who will you flock after? Who will you follow? I want to argue this morning that though there may be many so-called shepherds out there, they will all disappoint you. Unless, like David, they're pointing you to the one true shepherd. That's why pastors, which the word comes from a Latin trans transliteration of the translation for the word from shepherd. That's what pastor means. It's another word for shepherd. We're not senior pastors. We're not chief pastors. We're just under shepherds, under pastors, because there's one shepherd, one pastor. And if I ever point you to trusting in me, please kick me out, because I will disappoint you. My job is to point you to the true shepherd, just like David was doing, pointing to the true shepherd. And why is he doing this? Why is the Lord such a good shepherd? So let's track along. What does this shepherd have to do for us? How is he good for us? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, I lack nothing. How is that so, David? Tell me. That's because he provides. Look, verse 2, verse 3. The Lord's my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He provides for my need. But you may be thinking, okay, I can get provided by the government. The government could provide for my need. What do I need a good shepherd for? Because remember those two enemies, sin and death. How does this good shepherd provide? Listen, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Why is that significant? Because the very soul that once was twisted and crooked, the very soul that le leads us to pursue paths of unrighteousness, he restores. You see that? The very heart that is crooked and broken and leads me to pursuing the ways that are wrong, the good shepherd restores. And look at what comes next. He restores my soul and he leads me in paths of righteousness. Could also be translated paths of justice. Do you see that? He doesn't just tell you, hey, walk this way. He actually enables us to walk that way. The passage that Jim read this morning in Ezekiel 34, the Lord saying, I will shepherd you. I will be your shepherd. If we keep reading and we go to chapter 35 and finally to chapter 36, we see that this good shepherd, the Lord himself, will do something for his sheep. I want you to listen to what he's going to do. This is Ezekiel 36. In verse 21, he says this. 22, actually. I'm sorry, verse 24. I will take you from the nations and gather you from the countries. I will bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you, and I will cause you to walk in my statutes and I will cause you to be careful to obey my rules do you see how the good shepherd provides he doesn't just give us enough for today he gives us what we actually need which is a restoration a heart transplant the shepherds of this world can do nothing about the brokenness of your heart 
They can do nothing about the temptations and the way that we lean towards fulfilling those temptations. But the good shepherd can take that broken heart and make it new. So that we can walk in paths of righteousness. This is Ephesians, uh, Philippians. He who begun a good work in you will complete it to the end. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. In other words, walk in paths of righteousness and justice and freedom. Why? For it is he who is at work in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. When God works in our life, He doesn't just call us to do what is right. He enables us to do what is right. That is why He's the Good Shepherd. He provides by restoring us so that the great enemy, sin, will no longer have power over us. Paul, in Romans chapter 8, he says this, If we walk by the Spirit, we fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. That which by the flesh we can never accomplish, by the Spirit we can accomplish justice and freedom. That's why he's the good shepherd, because he provides restoration. And notice what he says, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Once again, if we look at Ezekiel, and I think what's happening here, the authors of scriptures, they themselves read scripture. What a novel idea. And in reading their scriptures, they actually, being led by the Spirit of God, would develop things that they read in scripture and explain them further by the revelation that God would give them. I think Ezekiel had read Psalm 23. And as he's understanding how God promises to be the good shepherd, to restore our heart, to do all these good things... He is reflecting on that as he writes Ezekiel 34, Ezekiel 35, Ezekiel 36. In other words, I think Ezekiel has Psalm 23 in his mind, just like Paul does. Listen to what Ezekiel says. Once again, I'll read that same passage I just read, but this time I will start in verse 22. Ezekiel 36. Therefore, says the God, say, uh, therefore say to the house of Israel... Here's what the Lord God says. It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when through you I vindicate my holiness. Before their eyes. And then he goes on to say how he's going to cleanse our hearts, give us spirit, enable us to walk in the paths that are right. And look at what the psalmist says. Look what Saul, uh, David says. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The very same thing Ezekiel said. What does that mean for his name's sake? It means that as He restores our heart, as we walk in paths of righteousness, we don't do it so people will think highly of us. We do it because it enables us to display the God of glory. It enables us to display the Good Shepherd so that all the nations will know He is the one true Creator God. He restores us so that we, who once were broken signposts, will become restored signposts, pointing to the God of glory. We, who were meant to be mirrors, reflecting the, God, the glory of God, have been shattered, but He restores us so that once again we can be mirrors. Not showing off our own light, but showing His light to the world. For his name's sake. And in that, as we saw a couple weeks ago, in that is true honor and true glory. Because that's what we are created to do. And in that is true fulfillment. And in that is true purpose. He is the good shepherd because he provides restoration. We could walk through all of Paul's letters. Paul had this thing in his mind. We've been saved so that we can serve and show His glory. We've been redeemed so that we can show and display His glory. We've been reconciled so that we can go about reconciling others. We've been put right so we can put others to right. We've been restored. Our souls have been restored so that you and I can go outside today and we can show this world what true justice looks like. 
what true kindness looks like, what true honor looks like, what true love looks like. That's why you've been restored. When, like Maddox this morning, Max came down from the stairs, I gave him a hug, and I squeezed him, and he said, What, Danny? I said, I love you, buddy. And he said, What else? <laughs> <laughs> Can I watch a movie? <laughs> what else? Isn't my love enough? The fact that I provide for you enough? See, but that love shows itself, as Jesus says in John 13. When he loved his disciples, he loved them till the end. See, because love, as Paul once again in 1 Corinthians 13 says, well, love perseveres. Love doesn't give up. Love continues. Look what the Good Shepherd does. He not only restores our soul, not only does He defeat the powers of sin, but notice what He also defeats. He defeats the power of death itself. Listen. Verse 4. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Do you see that? The greatest enemy, death itself, poses no threat for the sheep of God. Why? Because I'm powerful and strong and I can stand on my own, like that poem, if you've ever heard it, Invictus. I am the captain of my soul. I am the master of my faith. Have you heard that poem? It's basically this guy talking about when he faces death, he's going to be unmoved because he has a mighty, strong personality and he'll be able to face death without a problem. He doesn't need... He says, he even says this, he says, I think whatever gods may be out there, I thank them for my unbroken spirit. I will stand whatever comes when I face death. I will stand firm because I'm the master of my faith. I am the captain of my soul. Is that why we don't fear? Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, when it comes my turn to face in the great enemy, the one who's defeated everyone, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. You see, the God we serve, the God who created the universe, He is not like a watchmaker who makes the watch, makes the world, turns it up, and then just lets it go and watches from behind. A lot of people think of God like that. No, he's the God who, yes, created all things, but he steps into the world. And from the get-go, his desire is to walk with his people. And he will walk with his people even through the dark valley of the shadow of death. And not just that, but he will bring them to the other side. Even if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So when death comes, when the darkness comes, when the great enemy comes, I don't have to fear. Not because I have big claws. Sheep have nothing. What can a sheep do to protect itself? Run to the shepherd. That's it. The rod and the staff of the shepherd are where true freedom is found. Because my claws, my wool, will do nothing in the face of death. But the rod and the staff of the shepherd will enable me to face death, even though I'm a little sheep, unmoved, with no fear. I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And he walks with us through death into the other side. Look at what happens on the other side of, this, of the valley of shadow of death. You prepare a table before me. Somehow he makes it to the other side of the valley of the shadow of death. And on the other side, he prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. All these enemies who once scoffed at me, who said, you're just a little sheep, you trust in God, ah, you don't have anything. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. He anoints my head with oil, my cup overflows. He walks with me through death and takes me to the other side. And on the other side, he honors his sheep in the presence while all the enemies who try to bring the sheep down stand shamed. And so with Paul, he says this, At that moment, we will sing the song of victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Thanks be to God, through whom Jesus, through Jesus Christ gives us the victory. He is the good shepherd because he provides for 
our need of restoration, enabling us to walk the path that's right. He's the good shepherd because he provides victory over death itself. He provides resurrection. But once again, I love you, buddy. What else? What else? So this good shepherd, he can provide restoration. He can provide victory over death. What about then? What if he decides to leave me then? What if he decides to let me go then? Does he, is he just going to take us to the other side and let us go? Verse 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of who? The Lord forever. He not only provides the restoration that you and I need so that sin has no power over us. He not only provides the resurrection that we need so that the death has no power over us. He holds on to us. He preserves what He provides. He preserves what He provides forever. Remember Jesus? John chapter 10. What did Jesus say about Himself? I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And listen to His words in John chapter 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, the person who's not a real shepherd, when the wolf comes, he leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf will snatch them and scatter them. He flees because he's not a real shepherd. He's just a hired hand. He doesn't really care about the sheep. But I am the good shepherd. I know my own. My own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the sheep. And I will lay down my life for the sheep. And now down in verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And here it is, verse 28. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. Not a single one of them will be snatched out of my hand. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And I and the Father are one. Why is He the Good Shepherd? Because not only does He provide restoration, not only does He provide resurrection, but He will preserve these things that He has provided. He will never let us go. The shepherds of this world, can they offer that? Can they offer restoration? No. Can they offer resurrection? No. And even the things they can offer, can they preserve those things? No. But the Good Shepherd not only can, but He will. And He will do that for you. So I invite you, if you don't know the Good Shepherd, come talk to one of us that we might lead you to the Good Shepherd because He will lead you in paths of righteousness. Not me, not anyone else. The Good Shepherd will. And I pray that you would come to Him today because He has come for you. Let's pray. Father, You are the Good Shepherd. We thank You, Lord, because You do not leave us and You will never forsake us. We thank you that you give us your spirit so that the enemy of sin stands no power against us. We thank you because your spirit will enable us to walk in paths that are right. And even when the great enemy death comes, we do not need to fear because you will walk with us and take us to the other side. I pray that you would help us to live in light of this that we would not try to pursue our own vengeance, not try to pursue to stand by our own strength, but that we would trust in you, that we would rely in you, that we would come to you as the good shepherd, the one who provides. Help us, O oh Lord. Help us today. We ask all this in the name of Jesus.
Amen.